This is the brand new Intel Core i9-13900K processor and it's installed on this previous generation ASUS ROG Strix Z690F gaming Wi-Fi motherboard. The question is will this 13th gen Raptor Lake processor behave itself nicely on this 12th gen motherboard? Or shall I be obliged to switch over to this Z790 carbon Wi-Fi motherboard from MSI? Well that's encouraging. And now let's see how our new Core i9 behaves on Z690. Default settings on this motherboard, we have boost power which is unlimited and sustained power of 253 watts. Wow, so let's see what happens in Cinebench 23. And that my friends, 5.5 gigahertz on the P cores. Holy moly. But note, this is a new processor on the previous motherboard. Who'd have thought that Intel would be the kings of backwards compatibility, unlike AMD with their AM5 platform? Over the past few weeks I've done a number of videos. I did that trip to Israel with Intel and I posted three or four videos subsequently about Raptor Lake, obviously under NDA, and it's only recently I've actually been able to test the processors and find out for myself what I think when I posted those videos. I hadn't at that point used 13th gen, so I was going by what Intel had told me, and I wasn't able to actually verify any of their claims at that time. Intel gave us something of a mystery. What they were telling us was that they had increased the number of E cores, they had increased the area of the P cores and had added cache. They had tweaked the fabrication process in 13th gen over 12th gen in some mysterious unspecified manner. And the 12th gen and 13th gen Alder Lake Raptor Lake processors were backwards and forwards compatible with Z690 and Z790 motherboards. Before I could install the Core i9 1200K in this ROG Maximus Z790 Hero motherboard, which is the one I've been using for testing the 13900K, I had to get a bias from the ASUS R&D people because as the board was supplied, it supported 13th gen magnificently, 12th gen it would not post, and I did not expect that. Once I had the BIOS and the R&D people, it's been fine. So it is perfectly possible if you get yourself a brand new Z790 motherboard and then drop in a 12th gen processor, that it won't work. And that's unexpected. No doubt that will work out over time. The other thing is that backwards compatibility of putting the 13th gen in a Z690 motherboard, you may well find that firmware updates the motherboard mean that once you updated the BIOS to support the 13th gen processor, you will be unable to roll your BIOS back if for some reason you are unhappy with it. I've done that with that Strix, it's perfectly fine, I wouldn't want to roll the BIOS back anyway, but the fact is, should I choose to do so, I cannot. After my briefings with Intel, I was left with uh, something of a conundrum. They've made massive claims about the 13900K. Sure, it's got more e-cores, but where the heck does the extra clock speed come from? And those performance claims, 40 plus percent performance multi-thread and 15 odd percent single thread, those are huge increases in performance. And so, of course, we have to double check Intel's homework. The hardware I'm using to review the i9-13900K is very similar to the hardware used by Luke in his recent Zen 4 review. Obviously we want to be able to compare processors reviewed by both myself and him, and so having very similar testing platforms helps. We start with a Seasonic Prime TX1600 power supply, and I have this Gigabyte Radeon RX 6950XT graphics card. Luke is using a Sapphire version of the 6950XT. The motherboard, as mentioned, is this mighty Asus ROG Maximus Z790 Hero. Processor, i9-13900K. I have two lots of G-Skill memory here. This is their Trident Z5 RGB rated at 6000 mega transfers. This is some 6800, which we ran a news piece on on KitGuru very recently, and they FedExed it to me in just the past couple of days. Visually, it looks exactly the same as the 6000. However, it does indeed run faster. I don't have a price on it yet. I don't think it's on sale yet. Uh, so I've put in my test data, some figures including the 6800, uh, but Luke with the Zen 4 is testing with 6000. I've tested with 6000. 
the 6800 information is really for added interest. And then the CPU cooler is this Corsair H150i Elite. The SSD is already installed under one of the heatsink covers. It's a Sabrent Rocket 4.0 M.2 NVMe. And I'm using Arctic MX4 Thermal Compound. If you allow the new i9 to run at full power, so that's TDP 253 watts, although this board boosts beyond 300 watts in the first minute, it will run hot, as I showed you in that intro. If you don't apply enough thermal compound, I saw rather, during my testing on one occasion when I didn't apply enough thermal compound, let's be entirely honest, I saw the all-core speed drop from 5.5 gigahertz all-cores to 5.3 gigahertz all-cores. A bit more MX4, all was well. There we have it. A lot of heat, a lot of power. However, the processor does successfully shed heat. And on with the Corsair cooler. One final piece of housekeeping. The cables are messy on the Corsair because I don't bother with the RGB cables, so they're hanging free and aren't connected to the hub. And the three fan cables are connected directly to the motherboard so I can control the PWM through the BIOS rather than using Corsair's IQ for that job. The BIOS setup screen of the ROG Maximus Hero will look familiar from previous reviews. There are an awful lot of features you can dabble with. We're going to enable XMP for the DDR5-6000 memory. Check out the power settings for the processor, but for the time being we're leaving them on auto. We've already set the fan profiles for the three fans on the Corsair AIO. So they start off nice and quiet and then as soon as the temperature starts to go up, they ramp up fast to maximum speed. And that's it. F10 to save and off we go to Windows. We're going to do a quick blender run to show you how the Core i9-3900K behaves when you've got 253 watts long duration power and unlimited boost power. It might get slightly noisy. So the package temperature is up at 96 Celsius, P cores 5.5 GHz, E cores 4.3 GHz, fans are running at 2000 RPM just as they ought to, CPU package power 312.5 watts, package temperature has crept up 99 Celsius, Maximum core within the package, 100. Package power has now dropped to 2.5, just under 2.5, 252. And P cores are still at 5.5. That's an impressive score, but you will note the new Core i9 is beaten by the new Ryzen 9. Before we get into our testing results, a little bit of explanation about the power settings that we've chosen to use. Intel showed us a slide in one of their briefings which claims huge efficiency improvements for Raptor Lake over Alder Lake. You can see they're claiming 41% improvement over Core i9-12900K at 253 watts, that's the default setting. They're claiming plus 37% at 241 watts, i.e. the same power. They're claiming plus 21% at 115 watts, which seems like an arbitrary figure. And then they're claiming equal performance at 65 watts. To my way of thinking, we can park the 65 watt figure because who in their right mind is going to spend £700 on a new Core i9 and run it at a quarter of its power. Cinebench R23 multi-core, it's a win for the new Zen 4 Ryzen 9. The three figures behind it, all Core i9-13900K, even the 115 watt figure, which is quite remarkable, beating the 12900KS. However, when we run at 253 watts and add in DDR5 6800, yes, that's a bit of a cheat, the new Intel processor sneaks in at the top of the chart. We can see here power consumption, so we know all about the Intel power settings. And you can see that the old Core i9 in that test was pulling 262 watts. And this chart demonstrates that the Ryzen 9 is running on significantly less power than the Intel Core i9 when it's going flat out. Cinebench R23 performance per watt. This is one of Luke's favourite charts. So we take the Cinebench score, we divide it by the number of watts required to achieve that score, and we can see the new Ryzen 9 in eco mode at 88 watts cleans the field. It scores well using very little power and wins. 
However, second in the chart, the new Core i9, running at 115 watts, an impressive score on very little power. Another Luke chart, Cinebench R23 score divided by the cost of the processor in pounds, which let's face it these days is the same as euros and dollars. What you can see here is that the Ryzen 7 3D, which performs well in games but less well in pure CPU tests like Cinebench, and it costs a lot, does not do well in this chart. Then you can see the Core i9 and the Ryzen 9 running at low power, they don't do well either, but of course the price is a fixed element. Head to the value end of the chart and you can see the new Core i9 priced at £700 does rather well. The old Core i7 is the best in this chart. Temperatures. Now obviously this depends on your cooling solution, but the critical thing here is also power. So when you're running these processors on low power, they cool beautifully. So in that sense, the Ryzen 9 and the new Core i9 match each other at 55 Celsius. However, once you start to crank up the power, you can see a slightly different story, which is the old Core i9 is the hottest processor in the chart. The new Core i9 running on 253 watts at 5.5 gigahertz, 87 Celsius. That is a very reasonable temperature. Cinebench R23 single core. The new Core i9 is at the top of the chart, regardless of power setting, and yes, two of the eight cores will indeed boost to 5.8 GHz out of the box. Wow! Blender Classroom, the test you just saw. So the chart is topped by the new Ryzen 9, and then we have the Core i9 on the different power settings. Surprisingly, the 115 watt 4.1 GHz figure is ahead of the Ryzen 9 5950X. This new 13th gen processor has a lot going for it. Handbrake H.264 conversion. Topping the chart, the new Ryzen 9, and then close behind we have Intel. Another cheat on my part, adding in some DDR5 6800 memory, and now Intel tops the chart. Handbrake H.265 conversion. Again, the Ryzen 9 tops the chart. This time, even adding in DDR5 6800 doesn't quite swing it for Intel. Intel doing well, but AMD is at the top. 7-zip benchmark. AMD at the top, Intel close behind. Ada 64 memory bandwidth. Shock horror, the Intel with DDR5 6800 tops the chart. If we level the field and we use DDR5 6000, we can see both the 12th and 13th gen are pretty much tied. 3D Mark CPU Profile. It's the new Intel Core i9 at the top of the chart. Very close behind, we have the new Ryzen 9. 3D Mark Time Spy, just the CPU score. Blimey, it's Intel all the way down. Even the Core i7 makes a showing before we get to Ryzen 9. This test, for some reason, favours Intel. And then we get on to gaming. Far Cry 6 at 1440. Top of the chart, we have Intel Core i9 on the three different power settings, and then we have Intel 12th gen. After that, we get to AMD. Far Cry 6 1080. Again at the top of the charts, it's Intel. I snuck in the DDR5 6800 to see whether it made a difference, and it helped very slightly. After the 13th gen, we have 12th gen, both the i9 and the i7, and then we get to AMD. Hitman 3 at 1440, Intel at the top, AMD 10 frames behind. Hitman 3 at 1080, the new Intel at the top of the chart, followed by 12th gen, followed by AMD. Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1440. Now realistically, all the processors are pretty much performing at the same level, but Intel just squeezes out the win. Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080. Yup, it's that Ryzen 7 3D processor at the top of the chart, followed by the new 16 core Zen 4, and then we have the new Intel. Watch Dogs Legion at 1080. This chart's all over the place. At the top, we have 12th gen Intel, followed by the Ryzen 7 3D, followed by the new Core i9, followed by Zen 4, followed by more Intel Core i9s. Borderlands 3 at 1080. AMD takes the top couple of slots, then it's Intel 12th gen, just sneaking in ahead of Intel 13th gen. You may wonder what those last two charts demonstrate about the new Core i9. 
And what I think they demonstrate is that benchmarking games can be an absolute nightmare. Also, we've just had the H2 update for Windows 11. Intel wanted us to use the H2 update because apparently it improves ThreadDirector. And it certainly, whilst it seems to help in some areas, seems to have caused problems in others. I wouldn't be the least bit shocked if the update to Windows clattered at least one of those two games. Intel is absolutely categoric that 13th gen should beat 12th gen everywhere. I don't think that's necessarily entirely true, but it is certainly a complicated processor and the idea you require big Windows updates to make it work correctly, I think that's telling you something about the modern world. So let's get to the pros and cons for Core i9 13900K. Pros, amazing gaming performance, no argument there. You get huge clock speeds from the Raptor P cores. They're, they are truly surprising, um, much, much faster than I expected some months ago and exactly in line with what Intel was telling us we'd get. Impressive support for fast DDR5 memory. Thank you, G-Skill. Uh, the 6000 was necessary, so I could uh, test at the uh, same speeds as Luke with the same memory. The 6800, that was fun. Um, memory testing for reviews can be a nightmare, but we're going to have to dig into this further. Uh, I don't know about AMD, but with Intel, it seems to be quite clear that fast memory has some benefits. Pros, back to those. <laughs> Creators will love the new Core i9. Uh, the performance in Cinebench and Blender is just huge. Um, that claim of 41% uh, multi-thread improvement, I think my, uh, my calculations reveal it to be in the high 30s, but uh, certainly significant. And it seems to me the 115 watt setting for the new Raptor Lake, uh, that suggests to me that Raptor Lake laptops could be very interesting. Of course, they'd expect to lean on the E cores as much as the P cores. Uh, but uh, I think we're gonna see some good stuff coming from Intel in the way of laptops. Cons, the negatives, pushing package power to 253 watts sustained and that bursty 310 watts, which is just brutal, pegs the CPU at 100 Celsius or very close to it. You can actually adjust the bias on the ASUS uh, if you want. You can put the limit up to as far as 115 Celsius. No thank you. Ambient here at the minute is like 21 Celsius. We had 37, 38 in the peak of summer. So the idea of taking all the headroom uh, and using it up now strikes me as absolute lunacy. Uh, we've seen a similar behavior, of course, with Zen 4. The manufacturers are shoving power to get the speed and uh, to hell with the heat. Uh, that's a decent liquid cooler. Uh, well done, Corsair. Seems to me that custom loop on this processor could well be the way to go. Another con, Intel hasn't yet provided samples of the Core i7-13700K. Uh, when I did the i7 12th gen, we did that a few weeks after the launch because we couldn't get out of a sample in the first place. It'll be the same this time round. I suspect that processor will be impressive. The core configuration is the same as the 12th gen Core i9, but the improvement to the cores, if we're going to get something approaching 40% improvement, even if it's 25%, that's going to be good. So basically what I'm saying is the i9 good but hold your horses because the i7 may well be almost as good for 200 quid less. And finally the Z790 chipset brings very few new features to the table. It's a bit of USB, it's a bit of PCI Express, nothing much to write home about. Intel could frankly have stuck with Z690 uh, and held on to one chipset for two generations. Of course that would be entirely unlike Intel but it would have been good to see uh, overall, I'm giving the Core i9-13900K a worth buying award, an 8.5 out of 10. In the mighty processor department at the minute, to me, that 16 core Zen 4 just squeaks it. However, I'm holding out great hopes for the rest of the 13th gen lineup from Intel.